from the threshing floor and it is my privilege to host these conversations with uh, my friend Dr. Joseph Lumpkin and we're going to talk about uh, some issues that I think a lot of people, especially people who are struggling with their religion, with their church affiliations, with their spirituality, will be informed by and uh, enlightened a little bit as we go through these conversations. So, uh, Joseph, it's good to talk to you again, my friend. Well, Good to see you, Randy. Thanks for having me. Joseph is the publisher of Fifth Estate Publishing. That's fifthestatepub.com. And uh, it is Fifth Estate Publishing that's presenting these shows. Part of the conversation that we always seem to have, Joseph, is the difficulties that believers, specifically Christians who are struggling with their faith have, in dealing with this thing we call the church, in dealing with the institutional church versus what I think we've come to understand was more the mystery body of Christ. And you've written a number of articles and books over the years on this. Uh, the Dark Knight of the Soul probably jumps out to me as being one of the the best examples of things you've written about this ongoing struggle with faith. And, of course, your recent book, The Didache, also goes into a very different view of the history of the New Testament church. So it looks at times like this whole thing went off the rails. Where did it go wrong? How do we reconcile the historical differences, the spiritual search, and balance that against our, 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 our religious programming? Well, um, we in the church hear over and over again, the church is not the building, the church is the body of Christ. And although the, we, we hear that and we repeat that, it, it, it doesn't sink in, we really don't get that. Uh, we went off the trail, the track, the moment that we really lost track of that one thing. When we gave the body of Christ or the power of entrance to the body of Christ to an individual or a group or uh, an administration, whatever you want to call the church, we went wrong. Uh, there is a saying that when the church was in Jerusalem, it was a spiritual movement. When it moved to Rome, it became an institution. And when it came to America, it became a business. And that really is not too far from the truth, yeah. except that it was yeah. always a big business. We just didn't realize it. An institution is a is a business that is uh, dedicated to keeping itself alive. Mm -hmm. So we have to roll back to about the first 200 to 400 years. And uh, in that period of time, we had the church as a horizontal structure. The church was a horizontal structure as far as a business template goes. We spread out like grassroots. Every individual body ministered to its its own congregation and surrounding areas. The monies were, were kept in that body. They didn't cloak it in tithing. They cloaked it in uh well, they didn't cloak it. It's, it was a donation. It was a love offering. It was a gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that that was the, the template for the first two to 400 years. Now, 
as the Bishop of Rome seized power, he needed to maintain that power. And to do that, he needed to uh, build a structure that had people going out to make sure that the rest of the world was doing his will. Checks and balances, administration, so on and so forth. At that particular time, he began to set the money up into a vertical structure. And the church began to grow this way toward the top, being and became the Pope, of course. And then you had uh, the diocese, archdiocese, bishops, churches. And all of a sudden you had not a grassroots spiritual movement where people cared about other people, but now you had a government and uh, a, a business and the purpose of any business is to grow itself. It seems like it went a long way from the, the, the revelation that Jesus gave us, because Jesus really didn't talk about, quote, the church. His statement to Peter was a confession of faith in which he stated, upon this rock I will build my church. And he really left it at that in terms of in, instituting or constituting any body politic, I, the vision is not well articulated by Jesus in the scriptures. We have to go into the works of the apostles to see how all this played out. And again, we're reliant on a history that's a bit broken and fragmented. And I guess what I'm asking you is, the view that you present in the book, The Didache, seems to tell us that there was a reforming not a reformation, but a reforming of the model of what became an institutional church versus a spiritual body. You talked a little bit about the horizontal versus the vertical. And I know in other conversations as well, you've talked about this idea of, of something that's kind of like spreads out on the ground and grows organically, whereas something that's vertical, you know, tends to be something that's built on a hierarchy principle. So, Spiritually, you know, I, I have never, um, I've never seen uh, grass blown over by the storm. Exactly. Uh, uh, we have crab grass here, and and the storm can come through, and it can wash, and it can do all kinds of things. But that crab grass stays where it is. Uh, the, uh, the the trees in the area will be blown over, snapped mm-hmm. into, hit by lightning, whatever the case may be. But the grass grows. You know, the grass grows as it may. And the church was supposed to be like that. So um, what we need to do is to start peeling back, like an ear of corn, peeling back the superfluous structure. And and what we come up with is something quite extraordinary, quite quite, uh, almost frightening, really, in its simplicity. Number one, we don't need government. We don't need pastors and and all of that stuff. We we had people back in that day who... uh, they expounded the scriptures and opened it up for, for those who could not read it themselves or, or you know, uh, gave different ideas. But we didn't have the idea of, uh, of, well, for example, we didn't have the idea of giving to the church is giving to God. That didn't exist because that's nonsensical anyway. Giving right, to the right. church in today's vernacular is an entertainment tax. We're, we're paying to keep the entertainment alive because we don't, if you roll it back prior to the Gutenberg press, nobody had a Bible anyway. So the salvation doesn't, it is not contingent on knowing the Bible. If it, if it had been, then 1500 years of Christianity stands null and void. And that's the first thing you got to do is just throw that out. I mean, the Bible is a wonderful book. It's a, it's a great roadmap. Uh, you know, right. we're blessed to have it. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with your relationship with God. It is, it is a map. A map is not the place. You know, there's a saying in, in the Eastern philosophies in the Eastern church that the, the sidewalk is not the church and the steps is not the the church and the building is not the church. The church is the church. You you look inside. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas says that the whole kingdom of God resides inside of you. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you take the Bible and you put that to the side as far as your salvation and the necessities go. Take the building, put it to the side. They didn't have that back then. Take the leadership and the and the vertical structure, put it to the side. They didn't have that kind of hierarchy. What they taught was really, really simple. 
you do, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do my commandments. Here's where we get all messed up. He didn't quote the Ten Commandments. That's not his commandments. Right. Yeah. Jesus' commandments were, love your neighbor, do what's right, don't do anything that you wouldn't have done to you, love your God, seek him with all your heart, mind, and soul, strength. That's it. The rest is commentary. Yeah. So when we say, oh, you must do the commandments, no, it's not the Ten Commandments. They're not going to save you. That's that's jurisprudence. It is not spirituality. It's religion. It's not spirituality. That's something that you do on the outside, not something that you are on the inside. Jesus addressed the only two things that was an inside job. The only two things that we have to really put our minds and hearts into. The rest of it. You talked about salvation a little bit there. And again, we have a perverted view of that. How do you define salvation? Well, salvation itself, the word, the word means wholeness. And, uh, we've taken that to mean healing and restoration and all that stuff, but that's not what it was all about. It is, it is wholeness within yourself. You come to grips with yourself and God and you, are whole within yourself, and that means that you are integrated. You are an integrated individual. My spirit, mind, emotions, body, they are integrated into a wholeness that allows me to be a complete person. That's not done easily, and usually it's not done overnight. Sometimes we have these moments of awakening, this aha moment, and we realize how disjointed, dysfunctional, and splintered that we are individually. But usually we are here digging and one of the saints, one of the Christian mystics said at the end of his life, so the problem is how to uh, uh, recognize and uh, eliminate those rats and dragons and come to grips with the fact that the house is whole and clean. Now, I don't mean clean like in clean of sin. I mean clean as far as not disjointed, because when that happens, then you can decide what you're going to do and you're not driven by your inner demons, if you will. When you say disjointed, are you talking about the, the lack of integration into the spiritual whole? Jesus, um, Jesus gave us a path. It was an inner path, and, um, and that inner path leads to self-examination. That's the problem with most of the people in Christianity. Christianity has become a, uh, an extroverted religion. Totally extroverted. Yes, we're there yes. for the music, we're there for the hospitality, yeah. we're there for whatever. When in actuality, the first Christians were very inverted, introverted, meditative people. The great mystic fathers broke away from what we would consider to be the church, although they considered themselves to be still with the church, but they did not, they didn't care about the dogma, they didn't care about anything, they just wanted Jesus, they just wanted to find him. And they came to a conclusion that anything that you can name, anything that you can taste, smell, touch, feel, hear, conceive of or think of, is not God. It is a creature, a creation of his, but it is not him. And so they started stripping away everything that they knew. And it's actually, the a book is called The Cloud of Unknowing that, that relates to all of this. Uh, desperate, if you will, spiritually desperate to find God, that they threw off all of the baggage of the churches and everything else, and they dealt directly with uh, with them and him. We've lost that. We, we have become discursive and not uh, uh, and not meditative. To do that, to become meditative, brings you internally, you have to face what you are. Your difference about spam theory, everything relates to sex, power, arrogance, or money. Everything. And when you clean away all of that, then, then uh, you're free to approach uh, some integration because there's no desire pulling against you. And yet those elements themselves are not the flaws, it's the hooks that they put into us. We know that each one of those elements is a part of our life and has its proper place, but it has become a controlling element. It's become a controlling element very much in the church. 
sex, power, what oh, was, yes. all of these things, all of the elements that you just listed, arrogance, right. money, yeah. have become the dominant right. modes. There are perversion within institutional churches today, as most of us who have been inside the institutions yes. I, now. I, uh, and I was going to say that I have worked for Trinity Broadcasting Network. I've worked for EWTN under Mother Angelica. And uh, I've been involved in, uh, uh, you know, Timmy Swaggart's missions, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it's all the same. It, it, it's all based on on uh, show and and, uh, and theater. And it's it's, a, it's an amazing thing when you when you look at it from a uh, this passionate view uh, as to what's actually going on is pretty pretty amazing. So, and again, I draw, I draw it back to the, the original salvation issue. The salvation issue isn't so much to do with original sin or the sins of our flesh, but our inability to begin to do the one vertical thing that counts, which is the vertical movement of the cross, which also has the horizontal movement as well. And how do we pull that together? What does what does our faith teach us about how we integrate the horizontal movement, the outreach, with the vertical integration, which is touching the divine? Touching the divine, that's an amazingly simple and difficult thing. Uh, I believe that we have that spark in us. I believe that we do touch the divine daily, but we have gloves on. And we need to take those off. So how to do it? Um, you, you skin yourself. You flay yourself. You, you, you bring out all of the things that's holding you back. Now, you know, Jesus told the, the rich man, that man, to go and sell everything he owned. That was just because that's where his heart lied. That's, that's, that's all that was. That yeah. is just, um, that was just saying, renounce what's holding you back, and when you get rid of what's holding you back, you'll be here. And, and that really is a template for what we have to do. We have to dig in. It doesn't mean we have to sell our house and go poor. It just means that we have to learn that, uh, that, uh, that's, that's not, that's, not God. That's a creation. And we hold it up higher than the creator. Strip away everything. When you find the silence, when you find the silence, God is there and he's not quiet. Yeah, you just went to the place that I've been underscoring for probably about almost two years in my shows. Something that I call the still, which is a point of contact. It's where you turn off the external. And we've not been taught this yeah. by our churches. Everything in a church service is external. However good the music, the praise and worship is, whatever's going on, the preaching, they're all externalized. People have not been taught to sit quietly and dwell in the presence, which back in the Psalms, David wrote about. And so often those Psalms closed with the word Selah, which means pause meditate, think about this. And the introspective aspects of this, we lost that. We lost contemplative faith. I don't know where that went out the door. I know there were orders that practiced this, but it wasn't taught to Christianity as a whole. We were taught evangelism, which I'm sorry to say I've done my fair share of, and it became very much tainted to me because of the way it was done. It was like oh, yes. treating people as sinners and reaching out to them <clears throat> rather than going to them as equals and saying in a testimony and a witness, which is your presence in God, that you could minister peace to them. Not by preaching, not that there's not a place for that, imparting the word. But you really hit on this because that silence, that still, is to me the single most important part of any spiritual walk. I don't even know where to begin because you covered so much territory, but I'll just, I'll pick a point. We haven't been contemplative since the church fathers uh, of, of the uh, 
the Christian mystics, uh, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Assisi. Those, those people were, were mystics. The church doesn't want you to do that because if you do that, then you don't need them. So they, they have no place in a con- contemplative Christianity. What are they going to do? Rent you the building? You, you don't need anything. In, in a contemplative Christianity, you don't need anything because you are all that there is. You and God, that's it. You are the temple. And, and when you get that, then the church has no place for you anymore. of it becomes fluff. Uh, so it's the exclusivity, you see. The church is based on exclusivity. You said you approach the center sinners like they were something different instead of peers. Yeah. Uh, that's very true because the, the church has to be exclusive. You, you have to be different from the outside world. Um, and, you know, we're supposed to be called out the called out doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't mean we're different. It means that we are that we are called to do something different, not that we are different. And therein lies the, the problem. Uh, you know, we're we're just as human as uh, as anybody else. So when you approach somebody in a holier than thou, you're a sinner, and I am not kind of thing. You're actually forming an exclusive club that you're inviting them into. It's not God's club. It's it's a religion. It's a denomination. You know, um, they're no more nor less a creature of God than I am. They may have better insights and better wisdom, deeper wisdom than I, just because they haven't called him by the right name or that they believe one thing and I believe another. I don't know that that makes them any better or any worse. I've always preferred to think that all men are equal in the eyes of God and that my relationship to another person is as an equal. We all have something to offer each other. The time that I spent doing street ministry, I learned as much from those people as I suspect they ever learned from me. And one of them was humility. One of them was being very real about where you are and how good you may think you are but somebody who's broken and knows they're broken is far better than somebody who's a pompous ass attempting to present Jesus Christ to broken people. It was one of the things that disturbed what me. What does God it. want? Yeah. A contrite heart. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. A contrite heart. So, you, you know, I teach martial arts as a, as a hobby, and I have for 42 years. And um, We were interviewing this young lady who had a, a fairly severe uh, a birth defect, and uh, she was wondering if she could be trained. And I said, you know, um, there's a saying that when you're ready, the teacher appears. And the problem with most teachers is that they haven't figured out 
but they are not the danger. They're yeah. they're as much a student as as the rest, yeah. and yeah. and so yeah, when you're ready, the teacher appears, and so when I walk around the corner, and and this situation occurs, I always ask myself, what part of this is supposed to be me learning, and what part is this lady learning? Because okay, I'm put in her path, but then she's put in line, and it's an equal thing. It's a, it's an equal thing. Well, if we approach Christianity like that, we would be a whole lot better off. A lot better off. It's, in, it's interaction. It's an exchange where the teacher and the student interact with each other in a way that <clears throat> both walk away. I mean, if nothing else, somebody like that teaches you to be a better teacher. The level of difficulty. And I and I think a lot of times oh, yeah. it's the difficult well, I mean, people she's that teach you. draw out of you. Yeah, I mean she's going to teach me fortitude and uh, tenacity and, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, a spirit that that is indomitable because she she is uh, coming from a place that I can't even imagine. So we will learn a lot. Well, when I come up to a person to present God, number one, I would never do that. I'm going to assume that God can present himself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume that God can defend himself or herself. I'm going to assume that uh, this is an interchange. And what I'm going to try to get out of it is, can you teach me something about going deeper, being authentic, and this woman, for example, did not come in pretending she had two arms. She was authentic. She came to me and she said, here is my problem. I have this disability. You know, she's facing it. Well, it's pretty easy to face something that is external. It should be just as easy to face something that is internal. One final question before we close out this interview, Joseph. What was the most surprising thing you discovered in your research and putting together the Didache? What uh, what took me aback was how much we have altered what was the beginning of the concept of what Jesus was. Granted that even back then they were trying to figure out who and what he was. But if you if you take for example the uh, idea that the Didache is what it says it is a book written by the twelve or even one or two out of the twelve, then you must come to grips with the fact that Jesus was not ever considered to be God. He was Messiah. He was anointed. He was a servant. He had a purpose, and he was sent. But never, ever did they consider that he was uh, God himself. We made that up. The, The Trinity came about... Uh, because uh, an emperor wanted to control the world, and the world was Christianity, and most of it, his world anyway. And so he wanted to unite all the Christians, and so he came up with this creed, or asked a couple of bishops to do so. And we have records that actually show that when those uh, bishops got back away from Constantine and wrote him back, they literally said, you've made us sell our soul. We have signed papers because we were afraid of you, and we don't even, even believe what we signed. So you take the Trinity and you throw it away, and you say to yourself, what is the purpose? What was he trying to do? In the first 50 years, when the Didache was written, it is a catechism of what was expected the new believers to believe and how they were supposed to act. It is painfully simple. Painfully simple. It, it is do what Jesus said because God sent him to tell us something. It was uh, serve one another because he served us. He came to show us how to live. And in that way of living, in that way of living, and in that way of searching, that's where salvation lies. Not some magic formula of the sinner's prayer. Words don't save you. 
intent, intent will. And, and that was being, what was being shown is you live with intent. And Luther had a problem with James, the book of James. He called it a, a yeah. straw gospel. Yeah. He said, I'd rather burn Jimmy in the fire. Well, James was one of the ones that probably wrote the Didache. Because if you look at, at the structure of James, you look at the structure of the Didache, you will see basically the same thing. And, and what you see is, uh, prove it. Prove it. Get out, do something, and prove it. Don't just sit there because if you can just sit there, if you can do that, you're lying. You're not, you're not where you're supposed to be. You will be compelled into service, into loving each other, into serving each other because that search leads you to a couple of things and this is the most important thing I think we can literally just close with, with, with the following statements if you do not become so deep and searching in yourself that you find yourself to be broken and you find that brokenness to be equal to everyone else and if that doesn't bring out in you compassion for everyone else, because they are as messed up as you, and you have realized how truly, deeply messed up you are, then you've missed the whole concept. Yes. You've missed it. Yeah. It is the depth of the self-realization that will bring you to your knees and will bring you to others in a way that will force humility and force service. That's a profound lesson to learn, and it's a, a, a stark contrast to what modern theology has taught us. And uh, we're going to wrap this interview up. Um, the Didache is the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, a different faith, a different salvation, from Fifth Estate Publishing, authored by Joseph Lumpkin. We're going to come back again in very, very near future and have some more of these discussions, Joseph, and go deep because I think a lot of people out there need to hear what it is that we've discovered as we kind of pulled back the covers and peered outside the box. And so we will return again very soon with Absolutely. another interview. I enjoyed it. I, I did too. And uh, Thank we'll you, Andy. Send you blessings and goodbye for now.